Thank you for joining in on this episode of Spiritual Unity. My guest today is Suresh Ramaswamy. Suresh is a transformational teacher and visionary entrepreneur, passionate about igniting and catalyzing the transformation of humanity. He is a spiritual teacher who not just works with light but embodies it as well. I have been very lucky to have had a conversation with him earlier on one of the episodes and if you haven't given that a listen, please go back to one of those episodes. And today lined up for our fun conversation is an entire episode on death, just like I'd promised. So thank you, Suresh, for joining in and speaking about something which is very close to my heart. And I know a lot of people would like to know more about this transition of ours, the most important transition in our lives. When I speak to a lot of spiritual teachers, they're very excited to speak about death as opposed to most others who like it's a dark subject. So why is that? So please start with that. Firstly, thank you, Nandita, for having me on your podcast. Delighted to be back. And I know we had a wonderful, wide-ranging conversation the first time we did the recordings last year sometime. I'm glad we're setting aside time to explore this very important topic of death and dying. Now, most ordinary people, they see death with some degree of confusion and fear, and it's almost like, let's avoid going there because it makes people uncomfortable. And this typical reaction of, I would say, bewilderment and trepidation is, is simply our conditioning. We, we don't like to think about things coming to an end because that seems painful. And if we don't look at it deeper, we just leave it there. We feel like death is painful, so why dwell on it? <laughs> so we just stop there. I think Woody Allen was the one who said, it's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> it gives us a clue. We just don't want to go there. I think a lot of our fears are kicked up, partly because we don't have a full understanding of what death is about, what life is about. And I think that's the wisdom when we understand that, that death suddenly is recontextualized and we see death in a different light. And then suddenly the sting is gone. We don't, we don't feel scared of death anymore. You know, death has a lot of fear. People associate death with fear, but the fears are also like from different aspects. One is the fear of personally, I'm going to die someday or I'm dying. Another is losing someone close to you or you see somebody suffering, maybe they're suffering from a disease. The different kinds of pain associated with death. Okay, these are the two primary ones. Yes. Uh, there, of course, like, you know, people who are like, what's going to happen to my son? What will happen to the property? That's, that's another level also. So now, does one learn how to view death from different perspectives or just one perspective is enough to deal with the sphere of death? <laughs> losing somebody close to you or seeing them die is a different pain as opposed to you yourself dying right. or the fear of it. Right. Absolutely. Yes. I think there's many aspects of our fear and confusion around death. Well, I think one of the things that really makes a dramatic difference, whether it's our own death or somebody dear to us, is a foundational understanding of what I call our finite self and our essence self. For those who want to, by the way, get a more comprehensive understanding, I talk about these in my book, Just Be. And in a nutshell, essence self is who we truly are. Every one of us, our essence self is our true nature. It's our infinite nature. And the finite self is everything else, our body, our mind, our emotions, our memories, everything is part of a more finite reality, which is very transient. What happens is we are often very identified with the finite aspect. And the essence aspect is almost something we don't pay a whole lot of attention to. 
So we get trapped in this very finite centric view of life and consequently death. If you operate from that perspective, death is incredibly scary because everything you see yourself as is coming to an end. All the relationships, uh, all the possessions, your body, everything is going away just like that. That's scary. And it's partly the same when somebody dear to us is, is going to pass on because they're going to be suddenly disappearing. All our interactions with them, everything comes to a grinding halt. Something in our finite reality is going to just stop. The more we are operating from that understanding, that finite is all there is, then it is very, very jarring and disturbing. The more unconscious we are, and when I say unconscious, I mean less aware, the more we tend to be trapped in a finite perspective. So we're spending all our lives thinking about, you know, job, career, relationships, all the things happening in the finite reality. When we really step back and say, you know, what is really going on here? What is my true nature? What is the true nature of reality? Then this essence self starts becoming more apparent and more significant. In fact, even though we think of life and death as, as opposites, in fact, life is no opposite. You know, the opposite of death is birth. Yeah. And life itself is eternal. Life does not come to an end. If you, if you think of it as we were alive, we existed even before we were born. And there was something there, and that took birth. It took, the, took on this body. So the body was born, and the body, sure enough, will die. But life will continue. That understanding, and if you think a little more what's really going on there, our essence pre-exists, pre-exists, and in the sense that it has been there prior to this body, and our essence essentially got linked to this form that we call our body. And then at death, it is unlinked from this form. The more we can see that we are this essence that is connected with this body, then we are less concerned because that is going to continue. So this is the a fundamental understanding, the finite self, the essence self, and the fact that the essence self is not being, uh, is not born and dying, it's eternal. This is something that death will show us when we actually die. But we fortunately don't have to die to have this wisdom and realization. Even when we're alive, when we're incarnated, we can choose to see past all the layers, all the superficial layers, our, our bodies, our personalities, all these things, we can see past it. And then we see our essence. This feeling into our essence gives us a clue that what's going on, the bigger picture. And that amazingly, it dissolves all the, all the fears, the morbidities we have about death, the scary thoughts we have. And it gives us an orientation, which is change how we see death and, and changes how we see life as well. You know, very interestingly, like how life and death are obviously interrelated. So how do you think we can use our life to be prepared for death? Because I feel if we only knew how to live life properly, we would know how to die properly. And the other aspect is, yes, philosophically, it's very easy to grasp your essence. We are not the body. We have something else which is finer and that doesn't die. Is it possible, because we're always going to have a body, to completely lose fear of death? So these are, I think, three interrelated questions. Is it possible to drop the fear of death completely in one lifetime? I mean, mm -hmm. there is always the body. There is always that moment of transiting. And 
In fact, just a while back, we were talking about the suffering. People are scared of suffering, not so much the transition. Yes. Okay. Lots of interesting topics to explore there. Great. I'm glad you're bringing all this up. So let's explore. Let's explore that. Absolutely, there's so many things that we can do in our life in order to really have a breakthrough and understand the nature of dying and death to such an extent that, that all the fear is gone. It starts with a willingness to think about it and to explore it. I think that's where it starts. That's important. Conversations like this can give somebody a framework of understanding, which I think is important because that itself will start giving us a sense that I don't need to be so scared of death. Mm. Um, and, you know, funny comment I came across is we, we've, we've heard how this only thing that's certain is death and taxes. Right. <laughs> and Will Rogers, an actor, he said, the only difference between death and taxes is that death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. So the wisdom about death is not something that's temporary. Once you truly understand death, this is going to be something very significant. It's very worthwhile exploring it. I know for myself, even in my 20s, I was very interested in, in death. I was actually fascinated by death. I guess I'm somewhat weird, but I have run into other people who've told me they too were like that. So I used to actually attend retreats, which were the entire retreat was about death and dying. You know, you can go deeper into that through meditations and exploring what the world wisdom traditions have said about death. And so, you know, that understanding is that since we're essence, Death is, it's like changing clothes, right? The body is simply the clothing for the essence. It's just like we don't become anxious when we change clothes. Uh, similarly, yeah. essence sees death just as a routine change in the outer garments. So we can relax a little bit. And if we remind ourselves, we've died many times, so many lifetimes we've lived. Mm. We've died so many times and still here we are. We're not dead. We're very much alive. That gives us the confidence that death doesn't kill you, actually. It, it, who you truly are, it doesn't kill you. So it's just this superficial layer, like a snake shedding its skin. The snake is very much there after it sheds the skin. So we start understanding this first intellectually, but then at deeper and deeper levels, okay? And so I think tools like meditation are very, very significant. So having a regular meditation practice, what it does is that you're sitting there quietly, doing nothing, thinking about nothing in particular. You necessarily start seeing something deeper. You see, if your eyes are closed, you're not seeing your body. And then there's lots of thoughts and emotions and memories and fantasies going on. But as that sort of settles down, you start glimpsing essentially the unknown. And what is that unknown? That's higher dimensional aspects of our own being. So we, we see the subtle energy aspect of our being. And then beyond that, we see the light aspect of our being. And then even beyond that, we see who we truly are, which is our infinite nature. So when we start actually seeing this more clearly, that is very, very significant because now that's going to take away our fear from a deep level because it, now it's a realization that we are essence rather than just a nice intellectual understanding. So these sort of regular practices where we get in touch with our essence. I think this is very foundational. Now, there are many practices one can do which are more explicitly focused on death. And I would say that would be like a sort of a, a more advanced set of things one can do. Foundationally, I think it's important to have a meditation practice. So we have some direct sense of 
I am much more than this physical body. I think that that has to come from regular meditation. So let me pause there for a second. I know you probably have some comments. Yeah. So I'm going to come back to this again, but so there is another aspect to death as we were talking about that suffering where yes. people fear the suffering. Now, is that uh, something that one can transition, therefore be made easier? Mm, absolutely. Okay. Yes. So. There's many things one can do, actually, if we just focused on the actual dying process. So it's, it's a kind of a topic on its own, whether one is dying oneself or being with somebody who is dying, somebody dear to us. Or in my case, I was a hospice volunteer for many years. And hospice, as you might know, is essentially... Um, when patients reach a point where death is imminent, so they mm. have six months or less left, then they are essentially handed over to the hospice, and the hospice mm. focuses on palliative care. So basically making the patient comfortable uh, so that they have a good end of life. Now, as a hospice volunteer, I was primarily there to be with the patient and help them in whatever way they want, right? So in some cases, a patient might want to talk about these kinds of topics that we're talking about. In some cases, not. You know, they, they don't want to talk about it. They just want you to help get a glass of water or remind them of pain medication to take and just those kinds of things. Um, but the point is that when somebody pays attention to what actually happens in the dying process, there is actually, firstly, an understanding that's very useful, which is how does the process unfold? Okay, actually, the process unfolds in a very systematic manner. The energies are gradually withdrawn from the gross body, and it's it's in a very systematic way. So you know all the elements the five elements that constitute the body, you know, earth, water, fire, space, ether, they, you can see each one of them dissolving and shutting down. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when the fire element leaves the body, the body mm -hmm. certainly feels cold. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and it, it will feel subjectively cold, as well as the body itself, the temperature actually starts dropping. When the wind element leaves, yea, the, the person has a hard time breathing. So they're starting to, the breath starts slowly shutting down. Mm -hmm. And so on. All this is unfolding. And in fact, if, if one is, is aware of it and knows it's going to happen like this, you can be a lot more relaxed and cool about it. You can be like, oh, look, you know. This is shutting down. Interesting. Now, suddenly my hands and feet are going ice cold. Okay, yeah, I see what's happening. It's the fire element is starting to leave from the extremities first and then slowly from the torso area. You can see these much more objectively. And this makes a huge difference because then what happens is you don't resist it, you don't fight it, and you don't freak out. So it's not like, oh my God, this is going on. Uh, you don't feel that way, whether it's you or a person you're you're being with. It's all like, oh, a natural process unfolding. There's a much more sort of uh, very accepting, very knowing that this is a natural unfoldment. This is significant because a lot of the suffering is actually psychological suffering. It was not necessarily physical suffering. A lot of times we think suffering means, oh, this must be hurting like crazy. It's actually the psychological suffering, which is much more significant than the mm -hmm. physical, actual pain related suffering. The pain actually is modulated by consciousness. Now, okay. a lot of people must be thinking, what the heck does that mean? Yeah. Let me give an example just to make it very obvious what I'm talking about. So somebody's riding a motorcycle, going pretty fast. They're turning and, and suddenly there's a truck. They have a head-on collision with a the truck. Mm -hmm. And 
bang, you know, they, they are flying off their bikes and they come crashing somewhere and it's almost like every other bone is broken. And it's like, you can't imagine a more nasty physical shock to the body and tremendous amount of internal organs are damaged. The funny thing is, if you look at near death experiences and the accounts where somebody had such an accident mm. and they felt this sudden impact for just a brief moment and all the pain that their body was going through, they, they didn't feel that at all, actually. So all that terrible stuff going on, they didn't feel it actually because the consciousness has already had the wisdom to create some space between them, the consciousness and the body. So the body is indeed going through a lot, but the consciousness is just fine. It's almost like, you know, imagine you've taken a, an aesthetic and you don't feel mm -hmm. that pain, that there's surgery going on, but you're just fine. It's kind of like that. There is, if there's intense pain, there is the ability to decouple from that pain that's naturally mm -hmm. built into us. So these things actually help us because they help us have a more detached witnessing perspective. And I think the psychological aspect is more significant in the sense that we have a more direct control over that and we can make it worse or we can make it not better. Mm -hmm. So if we have a spiritual understanding and ideally some degree of realization, then, then we can be really relaxed. The more relaxed we are, the more we are not fighting it. Then it actually takes away all the suffering. So it's, it's really quite smooth. It's quite painless in that sense. There might be some minimal physical pain, but it's hardly dominating the entire process of the transition. So there's a lot more to the transition, which includes you know, as the unlinking starts happening between the consciousness and the body, you reach a point where it's actually mostly left the physical body, but it's still noticing it. It's still connected with it sort of mentally, if you will. Mm -hmm. In that sense, it's kind of hovering and just looking. And also it's, it's looking back at its life and starting to see, wait, I think this life has really come to an end and let's see how did I live and who did I love? How did I actually, how was I in this lifetime? All those sorts of more meta perspectives start popping up and this is all happening still in the transition. So in terms of helping somebody, one of the things that's very useful is firstly have an environment, a physical environment, which is very conducive for them to feel peaceful. So whether it's the lighting in the room, the paintings in the room, the flowers in the room, you know, these yeah. kinds of things or any pictures that really give them a sense of upliftment are very useful to have uh, mm -hmm. because those are, they have an impression that they leave on the mind of the person who's passing on. So that's the physical environment. And then you can play music, whether it's classical music or it is high vibration chants, especially mm -hmm. those that are dear to this person who's transitioning. Mm -hmm. That their mind, instead of fixating on some petty thing, it starts listening to this because the, the hearing is the last sense to stop functioning. What we are saying to them is very important. They may not, it may not, it may look like they they can't hear you. And so what's the point mm. in saying anything? No, you, if you, you got to keep talking to them and also have other ambient sounds that are supportive of uh, what will help them transition. These are some of the physical things we can do now. Right after the, the body even shuts down. So technically the body is now dead from the doctor's point of view. The consciousness is still in the vicinity, so to speak. 
Mm-hmm. And it's still listening. The consciousness is, is, it can operate, you know, outside of the body. We need to continue to talk to the person who has passed on. And first is to remind them that you're actually dead. The body has died. So, mm. because as soon as the, we leave the body, we are a little bit confused. Like, did I really die mm. or what's going on? And so it's useful to hear that somebody saying, you're dead. <laughs> Relax. No worries. Mm. We're okay. You're okay. Right? The body is dead. Mm. And that reassures the consciousness of the departing soul that, oh, I actually have died. Okay, that is the first big aha for the dead person mm. who really died. Okay. Because for them, it looked like they're alive because they're kind, you know, they're, they're able to be conscious and, and think. So they, they feel like, you know, I'm still alive. So that aliveness is, of course, what I talked about earlier, which is we're alive even before we took birth. Mm-hmm. So this is the, they're back to that aliveness as consciousness beyond the body. And so they feel like I'm not dead. We have to reassure them that they are physically dead and it's okay. And it's okay. So this is a important step in helping them transition. Step one is as they are leaving the body. Step two is after they left the body, we can talk to them and they can hear us. Now they can't talk back to us because the body is Mm -hmm. dead, but they can totally see what's going on. They can see you, they can hear you, they can feel your thoughts and emotions. It's also very important for us not to get overly dramatic because we just discovered the person is dead and of course we feel tremendous amount of grief and loss. But ideally, if we have this understanding and we've gone through some of the grieving process even in prior days and weeks, then what happens is actually at the moment of death, you you don't have to have this big dramatic experience. And you can be more present to them. And the more you are present, they can directly sense that. If you as a person who's right there can be in a state, which let's say you're established in a very centered state and you're connected with your own essence, they see that and they're like, oh, they can draw a lot of strength from that. And they immediately kind of feel very centered themselves, Mm -hmm. which is the first significant thing for them post dying to get reoriented to the fact that they are dead. Everything's okay. And most important things are still just fine. (laughs) Existence continues. Life true life, life with a capital L, still continues. So this is the first two steps. And furthermore, now the consciousness with every passing hour, it, it has greater and greater distance with mm-hmm. its previous physical incarnation. It starts getting in touch with a larger reality. So it's entering into the energy realm or sometimes called the astral realm. And now it's, uh, it's still seeing the physical reality, but it's also seeing a much bigger reality. And there's a whole set of things we can guide the, the departed soul now to navigate okay. astral plane. Okay. And again, this, this gets to be a really advanced topic, but essentially I would say a couple of simple things we can do. Number one is send them our love and gratitude, which is very different than trying to grab them with attachment, which is a human tendency to hold on to them and try to, try to keep them here with attachment. Mm. That's not very useful. That's not helping them. That's not helping us. But instead, pure love, if we are able to send them vibrations of pure love, that I really appreciated knowing you. I appreciated everything you did for me. And our love continues, essence to essence. And I wish you well. It's that simple and that pure. That gives them a lot 
to cleanly cut the ties with the now previous life so they can much more gracefully step into what is presenting for them in the astral plane, which is usually higher and higher dimensions are presented as one leaves this physical reality. And for the departed soul, and of course for us when we are there, the key is to keep naturally progressing and moving to higher and higher planes. And we are able to do this if we are AA conscious, much more conscious. A lot of people, what happens is they actually go into this semi-conscious stupor post-death. It's like going to sleep. So they kind of go to sleep and they're kind of sleeping for X amount of time. And then they wake up in some plane and now they have to kind of reorient themselves and figure out what's going on. But the more conscious we are, the less we have to go into this stupor post, post death. And we can more consciously navigate and keep stepping into higher planes. The more we have evolved, the more we have mm -hmm. developed our consciousness, the more natural that is. We keep going higher and higher and higher and we are like, wow, this is great. This is great. We can keep going. And typically we, we can go up to a certain point and then we feel like this is about right. Higher than this feels too, too uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So we kind of stop there on some level, on some plane. We reach that and we stop. And so then we continue to evolve from there on, which is a whole other story. But at least you could see the general sense of how that right. process is unfolding. And, you know, when these souls transit and they start moving on, do they get help from higher beings or something? Because we get to hear a lot of stories about that. Do they get help from, I don't know, sometimes relatives, maybe higher beings, in some cases, gurus or whatever? Good question. Yeah. Fortunately, there is a lot of help. So there's connections, relationships from the past, beings who have passed on before us, they are available. To help. And depending on the person and what kind of spirituality they have, there are divine beings, there are spiritual guides, and then there is light itself, which, which is available to all of us to really take care of all these things. So in fact, even if you don't know any of these things, all these things are taken care of. But if we are a little more aware, it can significantly give us an advantage. In my book, I have a chapter on death where I talk about yes. death as a great opportunity. I think of it as a once in a lifetime opportunity because you can have a tremendous spiritual breakthrough as you're going through this process that I just talked about. Why is that? Because things are very fluid. Things are very fluid in that transition state. So in that very fluid state, any intention is amplified significantly and it, it immediately, it bears fruit. If you have a high intention for the highest possibilities, then that is going to happen instantly. So you can have radical, significant spiritual breakthroughs during the process of dying. In fact, in, in theory, you can go all the way. You can go all the way to full liberation if you are able to stay very pure and not grab anything, right, mm. as you're going through these planes. If you're able to stay very clear and not grab onto anything, you go all the way to your essence. So all of the relative, the skins are being released and you keep releasing them, you keep releasing them all the way, including very subtle constructs, everything, right? It's like a very opportune moment to make a dramatic leap in your evolution. And this would mean, were you able to 
obviously let go of attachment. Yeah. So when, when we look at uh, spiritual growth in general, we start looking at things like limiting beliefs, attachments, desires, mm-hmm. fears. These are, I would say, absolutely the big ones. They are significant uh, limiting aspects of our being that we want to let go of. But at a more advanced level, we really are letting go of not what seems very like an obvious attachment. It's actually our own subtle ideas about what reality is, what who we are. These themselves, while they may not seem like an obvious attachment, like I'm attached to my house, that seems like an obvious attachment. But Mm. these are subtle, very subtle. It actually shapes our the possibilities that lie in front of us. Because if I think I'm something immediately, that is going to now limit what is available as an option. So even very, very subtle things, constructs we're holding on to, they need to be let go of. And at the end of the day, if I were to simplify it, I would say everything you can think of, you got to let that go. So don't just put it in the category of here are my attachments. Yeah, I need to let mm. go of this. And these other things, they are nice. No, nothing. You can't hold on to anything. Okay. Even so-called good things. Right. So-called good things are also limiting because they essentially, they are based on the premise that I believe this is reality and this is a good thing. Well, In the absolute, there is no such thing. So anything you hold on to is going to limit you. It gets very subtle. And and that's why our practices during the course of the lifetime are very significant. Because, you know, like, what is this subtle and super subtle thing? Well, when you go deeper and deeper into your own consciousness, you can actually deal with these things. So you're not bumping into them only when you're dying. In fact, I think the scariest thing about death, if you ask me, is anything you have swept under the rug in your life, (laughs) right? (laughs) Subconscious stuff, and you're like, "Ah, I forgot about that. You know, it's gone. I'm not going to... All the things are going to crawl out. Okay. So if somebody has a lot of these things, it will feel unpleasant because suddenly all these things pop up. And they were unpleasant. That's why I swept them under the rug. Now they're all coming out. The more these kinds of things one has, the more challenging it's going to be during the process of dying and post-death. If you have a pure heart, a clear mind, and crystalline consciousness, then death is nothing to be worried about. It'll be experienced as a very easy natural transition. You will feel a tremendous expansion. You'll flow through all these transitions and you'll feel this glorious release. Like, wow, this is so cool. You will feel like you're thrust into unimaginable realms of light. That is so incredible that it's, it's impossible to even describe. That that's what is awaiting us. So if we've done our homework in cultivating all those things. So that's where, going back to what can we do in, in our life, well, fundamentally, pure heart, clear mind, crystalline consciousness, then you have nothing to be worried about. And all this boils down to our meditation technique or like our practice I think practices is... Uh, a very important piece of that. But then practices themselves actually are not enough because then it has to show up in the rest of your life. Right. So really, it's every moment of your life. But without having practices, it's hard to get into the subtle stuff. We don't have the sort of sensibility to go there. So practices inculcate our abilities to go into the refined, subtle aspects of our being. And then we got to apply that in our entire 
life, in our family, in our relationships, in our work, everything has to reflect our understanding, our consciousness. That's ultimately what's going to be very evident when we die. Mm. My next question is rather long. So the three parts to it. One is when you're talking about this transition and how five elements leave our body and the awareness is what we need to kind of work on, cultivate. Now, obviously it's the same for animals, I'm presuming. Um, but they don't have that level of consciousness or that attachment. So first question is, is it easier for them to transit? Second part is people who have a sudden death, like maybe in a car accident, like you were talking about, do they have the luxury of awareness? Third part is people who self-inflict the death. I'm talking about suicide. <laughs> do they have a different trauma? How confusing is it for transitions like this? All right. Okay. <laughs> so, so let's start tackling that. Let's the animals, with, I think, is quicker. Yeah, yeah. Let's start with that. In many ways, the transition of animals is a lot simpler, a lot less complicated, mm -hmm. because the mental, psychological aspect of humans actually compounds a lot of these things. That element is, is much more innocent and simple with mm -hmm. animals. They're able to much more without a fuss, so to speak, yeah. <laughs> right? They're much more in tune with the natural elements, natural forces. So they just go with that. And that's the recipe for us too. If you can go with where nature is taking you, everything is good. If you fight it, resist it, and try to do anything, then it, it, it'll be like it's now causing suffering. Now, some of the fundamentals we talked about still hold good. You know, these elements leaving the body, mm -hmm. the animal after it decouples from the physicality, it too is still seeing everything going around it. And it's, it's actually looking at it from a more expansive consciousness, just like us. And it's very much looking at us if it's a pet or something. I would recommend the same things. Mm -hmm. Sending your love, sending your gratitude. And essentially allowing it to move forward. And it will move forward. It does that much more naturally. In some ways, one could say it's, in that sense, it's easier, simpler for animal. Let's now take the second piece. What was the second portion of your question? part is if it's like a sudden death, like an accident. Yeah, right. Sudden death, interestingly, there is an abrupt aspect where the physical body actually instantly be crushed or stop functioning. So you eject the body rather abruptly. The good news is that doesn't seem to really bother the consciousness. All the many ways in which we can die, actually, consciousness is very capable of dealing with it. So in fact, like I said earlier, the pain is not going to be as big a deal. There is certainly the reflection where, oh, I see a body that's crushed and wait a minute, I think that's my body. There's a, perhaps a few minutes of, of um, reconciling with the fact that it does look like I'm being dead in this accident. It's not anything in any significant way takes away any opportunities. It's just that the decoupling from the body is a little abrupt rather than okay. gradual. But the real important stuff still holds good. So we can then feel into the expansion and keep naturally going with it. So those choices are still very much available to us. Right. And in all these cases, it's a tremendous relief, actually, when you come out of the body. It's been talked about as taking off a tight shoe that you've been wearing for a long time. Yeah. You take off the tight shoe, how does it feel? It feels like, ah, oh, it feels so good, actually. There's a tremendous sense of relief and expansion. And this is universal, absolutely yeah. universal. We actually feel a tremendous sense of happiness, actually, from that relief and that expansion. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the post-death states, there's a lot of positive stuff. It's only when we start becoming unconscious 
or we're dealing with previously unconscious material becoming conscious, that's when it's a little like dealing with unpleasant stuff. And in this regard, I want to mention something. And this is a little side thing, but some people might find it interesting. There was a movie back in the 90s called Flatliners. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, Flatliners, have you heard yeah. about that? Yeah. Yes. yes. So there's a group of medical students who get fascinated with death. And what they decide to do is a series of experiments. And what they would do is essentially stop the heart so the person starts dying. Mm -hmm. uh, this is stopping one of these, somebody in this group, right? Yet they're relatively mm -hmm. young people. They would stop the heart and then the, the, the unlinking starts happening, okay? And you start stepping into the first few levels of these after death states, okay? Mm -hmm. And they would do this just for a minute or short amount of time so that then mm -hmm. the heart is again revived and then the, the consciousness is back in the body. The person doesn't really die, but they get a chance to step into, you could say, the near-death mm -hmm. kind of states. And of course, we could talk about near-death experiences. That's a whole other fascinating topic. Yeah. But in this movie, the reason I bring it up is what they start seeing, all of them, is the very first few things that come up are unresolved stuff from their life that they had neglected to really bring to closure, these things start bubbling up. And it's almost like you have to eventually deal with it. So when you leave the body, it becomes the chance to deal with it. And so it can be a little bit uh, unpleasant. For some people, mm -hmm. it's in the movie, you can see some not so fun experiences. They are now revived and it's like, oh, I really don't want to go there. And so anyway, the Flatliners movie is all about that. And of course, there's lots of twists and turns I won't get into. And I certainly don't recommend anybody <laughs> trying to do something like that. I think it's not a healthy way to explore after death states. I would rather recommend deeper, wholesome meditations. There's great ways to do that rather than force the body to shut down. That could be very dangerous. That's a little bit about uh, after that states. And hopefully that's answering the question. That, so there's this subconscious yeah. material and so forth. What about when somebody inflicts it on themselves, decide that would do now in my life? Right. Right. In cases like that, there's a lot of aspects to it, but I will stick to the more typical scenario where somebody has just had enough with life. They feel so much mm. pain and suffering and they just decide to end their lives. The actual transitions are all, the fundamentals stay the same. They leave the body and they see there is, oh, here I am. I'm still there. I'm still very much there. And all those things that I was taking so seriously that were bothering me, they suddenly see that, oh, that was actually not that big a deal. I had just kind of contracted into a state where I felt it was intolerable and the only way out was to kill myself. That they realize is, oh, that was an erroneous conclusion. Okay. Actually, no matter what horrible thing is going on, they, they see that that's not a big deal because who they are is so much grander, so much bigger, so beautiful that they, at some level, they see that it is not a great thing in the life. Mm. So that conclusion comes up very quickly. Now, it doesn't mean that somebody's going to come and judge them or anything mm. like that. But uh, life is very precious. You know, a human body is very precious. And we want to do everything we can to evolve while we are here. So that process has been sort of hijacked and come to a premature conclusion. That is the unfortunate aspect of it. At the end of the day, we have many lifetimes. And so it's not anything 
ultimately that's held against you, so to speak. But it's certainly not a healthy way to grow. Yeah. So here again, when the person starts getting into the after-death states, the elements that made them kill themselves, they essentially as things they didn't want to deal with. Well, that thing is right there. They have to deal with it. You just have to deal with it in some other form. So whatever those intense emotions and things like that were, one has to view them from greater awareness, greater consciousness, greater acceptance, greater love, greater forgiveness. These things is what heals it. So they get a chance to do that, you know, later on. Okay. In that sense, it's nothing to feel terrible about. But, of course, there is the aspect they could have done that work while in the human body. In terms of helping them, some of the same things apply. You know, we can, we can still help them. We can still, I think for people like that, that orientation is especially significant. Because mm -hmm. they may feel a little more disoriented for a little longer because of the abrupt ending of life. So the more we can stay with them, with love. And when I say stay with them, I mean, they've left the body. I'm talking about consciousness to consciousness because your consciousness mm -hmm. is connected to their consciousness. You can, you can always be with them in that way. And even if you don't feel like I'm necessarily hearing from them, it's okay. They're still connected. You just have to trust that. Keep sending them love. Mm -hmm. Keep sending them assurance that all is well. Keep sending them assurance that they can relax into this bigger space that they are finding themselves in. So that if we can help them that way, we can help them keep moving further because sometimes it could take them longer and they can kind of be stuck for a little longer mm -hmm. in those intermediate states. So we help them. And, and as we talked about before, there is enormous amount of help from higher beings. Okay. So they, they're getting help from many places, but, you know, it's nice that we, if we can add our piece right. to that too. And the, the same thing, like the sending is love out to, would apply to anybody who has lost someone, whether it's now or it's been 10 years, right? Without being attached to the thing of, I miss you physically, but it's all right. I mean, not that negative attachment, I want you back, but is it possible to have a connection with people who passed over? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, going back to understanding the nature of reality, we have this sense that they died and they went somewhere. Okay. Mm. Actually, nobody goes anywhere. Okay. This sense of space and time that we have so strongly in the human dimension, in the higher dimension, space and time is very different. It gets to be more and more mm. diffuse and eventually totally thins out. So in fact, more useful way to think about it is all these higher dimensions are right here. It's like they're superimposed on this reality, this physical reality. So it's actually, they're not some, some far off galaxy or some such thing. Mm -hmm. All those higher dimensions are right here. They're all superimposed. It's just that the ones who passed on, since they are in a different dimension, it's like there's a thin curtain or a veil that ordinarily we can't see through that. It's like they're right there behind that curtain, no. behind that veil. <laughs> they're right there. So they're nowhere. They're not gone anywhere. So they are very much there sending them loving thoughts. Always good. Loving vibrations. Very good. Whether they died 10 years back or even longer, mm. they feel it. They feel it. And that is a beautiful way to be with anyone when you have nothing but pure love. It actually is, is tremendously healing and positive for us. And also it gives them more possibilities for evolving. So it's as if the past has got much more closure and a healthy conclusion. It gives them a positive push to keep going higher. So 
time and space are actually become irrelevant. Right. It's all right there. It's all right there. So <laughs> it, it's pretty mind boggling to ponder that. Another thing about people we were talking earlier about people who are transitioning as they are starting to leave the body, they, even during the last, let's say, of last few days of their life in the body, they start seeing more and more of these other dimensions. Okay. Okay. You know, in my hospice volunteering experience, a couple of uh, quick anecdotes about that. Mm. There was this gentleman, I would typically see them every week, sit down with them for some time. And this gentleman, Stan, one time I went and, and I sat in a chair next to his bed and we were talking and he was very much into all this stuff. So he would constantly be asking me questions about spirituality, higher dimensions. We would have awesome conversations. Mm. And I knew he was going to be doing pretty good. One time I sat down and was talking to him and he said, you know, Suresh, just before you came, in that same chair, I had a long conversation with a friend who was sitting in that same chair. We had a long, wonderful conversation. I said, great. He said, this friend passed away many years back. <laughs> but you could see he was as real as I was sitting in that chair. So this was just was one of the last visits I had with Stan. You could see how the interdimensional bleed through was already happening for him, which is one sign that the person is close to transition. They're seeing, they're already seeing angels, they're seeing spirits, they're seeing light, they're seeing old friends who died long time back. Mm. Another interesting experience I had, this lady who was 80 some years old in, in the hospice and she, she was not at all interested in spirituality. Okay. I would just sit, I would just sit with her and she would be watching TV all the time. TV was on all the time. So there was no real conversation and it was fine. I would, you know, I would hmm. just be there. And she told me even the first time I met, she said, I don't plan to die until I'm like 90 plus. So I'm not going to be dying anytime soon. <laughs> so I said, okay. I would meet her every week. And one particular week, she finally actually initiated a conversation with me, which was very interesting. She said, you know what? Nobody seems to be able to tell me this, but I am seeing this bright ball of light all the time. Like, like right now in this room, I see a bright ball of light and I can even see it with my eyes closed. Eyes open, eyes closed, TV on, TV off, uh, mm. sleeping, not sleeping. What is this thing? She said, do you know what this is? Is this something I should be concerned about? That was my first real conversation with her and my last real conversation because okay. soon thereafter, that was my last time I saw her before she transitioned. So I did, you know, I did talk to her about some of the things we've been talking about and nature of light. And I was telling her a lot about light and how that is significant. We can talk more about that because that's an important topic right mm -hmm. there. I talked to her about what this light was, that it was a non-physical, transcendental light. It is nothing to be scared of. And it's from a higher dimension and how, as she transitions, she can actually embrace it, move towards it. These were some of the things I told her. It's absolutely fascinating how these things unfold. And people, even non-spiritual people, they suddenly become spiritual. Yeah. They'll see all these things. Do you want to talk a little bit before winding up a little bit about this light aspect? And I have one last question. So I'm just going to add that in so I don't interrupt you in between. Okay. So it's often said we choose the way, the experience thing of our life before we are born. Do we choose how we are going to exit the body as well? And is it determined by karmic cycles or whatever one would like to right. film it as? Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. A good question. So let me, so I, I'm actually seeing three things we can hopefully squeeze in real quickly because they're all very important. One is the actual circumstance of death. Do we 
influence that? Do we choose that? How do we affect that? Second one is actually light, how we can engage with light. Very important, I think. And then the third thing is a little bit about narrative experiences. Because now, in the last 10, 20 years, we have so many documented cases of near-death experiences which have significant takeaways for us because they give us a, some clues as to what will happen and also how to make the most out of it. These are some things we can touch on. And it, it's amazing that even though we're just talking about death, there's so much. Can you imagine it's like, yeah, this, is, this should be the part two, I can. <laughs> yeah, I know. We we're talking about dying and uh, a funny quote from Annie Lennox, the musician. She said, you know, dying is easy. It's living that scares me to death. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So, so obviously, you know, that goes back to living is one of the best ways to prepare for dying. Yeah. You know, the, if you live well, and that includes some of the things I talked about, which is includes mm -hmm. living and cultivating a pure heart, a clear mind, and a crystalline consciousness. If you live like that, you're going to die really, really right. well. So that also ties in with the first topic, which is, you know, do we plan our death in some sense? You know, we, do we actually, before we're born, are we planning some of these things, including our death? Well, before we're born, first of all, it's highly intentional. Our birth is not some accidental occurrence. There is a significant amount of, I think planning is not the right word, but certainly intentional forethought, which is coming from not just us, but it includes wise beings who are helping us. So this collective wisdom certainly influences the specific birth we're going to take, where we're born, who we're born to, all those details. So the birth is, is very significantly planned. And the reason that is planned is because a lot of the successive significant elements in that life, such as major occurrences, they are, I wouldn't say definitively set in motion, but they are, there's a high probability of them happening. So the idea is that this, in this world, there'll be certain aspects of our learning that we're pretty likely to, to have these learning experiences. So we're going to have these learning experiences from, obviously, there's certain, maybe a certain job, a certain coworker, certain partner, et cetera, et cetera, including, obviously, family of birth. Mm -hmm. So some of these things, elements are actually sort of preconceived. We've already conceived it in a higher plane. Mm -hmm. Now... It doesn't mean it's going to exactly play out that way, but it is certainly set in that direction. So the probability is pretty high. And the reason is not so much to limit us, but to actually increase the chances that the life will be fruitful. Yeah. Yeah. And it also doesn't limit us in the sense that we will be here and we'll be stuck. Well, the certain elements obviously once you have a body, or that you have that body and whatever comes with that. But it doesn't mean every significant occurrence is all cast in stone. It will, there will be significant elements that you can still influence once you have taken birth. And I'd like to emphasize that the most important thing, we are given full freedom. And this is, we okay. lose sight of this. We keep thinking about events and people and experiences. The most important element is none of those. The most important element that you have full control over is your level of consciousness. Your level of consciousness is not static. You are constantly, dynamically choosing a level of consciousness, whether consciously or unconsciously. And this is where your focus should be. How can I keep my level of consciousness as high as possible? No matter what's going on. No matter what's going on. And there's going to be lots of things going on in the world that you obviously 
cannot directly control. But what can you directly control? Your level of consciousness. That is the most significant thing. If throughout life you are maintaining a high level and keep going higher, you are doing really well. It's, you will not be judged based on the specific circumstances that, oh, you know, you didn't will win a Nobel Prize. Well, your life was wasted. Not at all. <laughs> you know, it, it's where was your level of consciousness? That's the key. So going back to the death, death is yet another significant element of our lifetime that is indeed, there's some degree of planning around that. There are several probabilities and several forks in the road. It's not like there's only one possibility. There's several possible exits from life. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's some degree of that already in place. What we do does matter because it will influence which exit we take, whether it was as 43 or 83 or 93, mm -hmm. you know. So it's not like we just throw up our hands. So that's the answer to that. <laughs> okay. Let's see. The other thing was what? Yeah. One, uh, the light aspect. Of oh, yeah. Big time. Okay. So this is in some ways my favorite thing because we talked about practices and so on. Mm -hmm. If you engage with light, so what does that mean? That you develop a relationship with light. You connect with light, maybe initially, primarily in meditation. Mm -hmm. You connect with light and you feel light, you drink light, and light has a lot to offer you. And, and what am I talking about when I say light? I'm talking about the sublime transcendental light. Hearing. It's not the ordinary physical electromagnetic light. Every light we perceive with our physical eyes. But this inner light also we perceive with our subtle senses. We have mm -hmm. a subtle anatomy. We have subtle visual sense, which allows us to perceive inner light. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. This light, the more you connect, the more you engage with it in meditation at first, but then increasingly what happens is you stay connected to that light as you go through your day-to-day -day activities. So it starts with meditation, then you stay connected with the light, and then Here's another important thing. When you fall asleep, we no normally just disappear into that state. You want to call upon light and maintain that awareness of light as you drift into sleep. So it's as if you're going to go into this world of light as you fall asleep. So essentially your entire sleep time, you're surrounded in, in this cocoon of light. All this is actually incredibly good practice for the moment of death. Because, oh. you know, death is like the big sleep, right? You know, every night we get a chance to practice with our da daily sleep. If you've done a good job, when the big sleep comes, you are able to maintain awareness. You are able to stay very centered and calm. You see the body shutting down. You're all fine about it. And this light will draw you to higher and higher dimensions. And you, since you've already built this connection with light, it will feel very, very enjoyable. It will be like, wow, th this is, it's like you're finally going on this vacation that you've been looking forward to. It is just incredible. So when you die, you go deeper and deeper into the light. You move towards it, you move towards it, and you, you merge into it. You, you essentially dissolve into it. You know, that if, you, if you can go very far with that, you're doing really well. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so this relationship with light is completely changes how we might think about death, how we might experience death, and our post-death states. It, it just becomes good news from the beginning to the mm -hmm. end. I feel very, very excited about light as a tremendous partner that's going to hold our hands and it's going to carry us to as high a plane as we can handle. 
I would encourage everyone to consider that and work with light. I have lots and lots of meditations on my YouTube channel and there's various tools. If you want to go deeper, if somebody's thinking, yeah, that sounds good. What do I do? Mm -hmm. You can check out all these resources on my website and my YouTube channel. And also your book, just before everybody yes. who hasn't still come across it or picked it up, I think it's got tremendous meditations there. I've been practicing it myself. So yes, this is not just something I read. So for all the listeners out there who haven't picked up the book, you should. You really must if you want to engage with this light aspect. Yes, so. there's lots of tools and practices and explanations in the book. We started talking about our essence self. And the nature of this essence self is it's formless, it's timeless, it's dimensionless. And that becomes very apparent. When you realize we don't have a form, so something that doesn't have a form doesn't have a location. It's non-local. Only a form can have a location. So that's why I was saying earlier, we don't go anywhere when we die. Only something that has a location can go someplace. Something that has no location, our essence, it, there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. Consciousness is infinite. It's everywhere. And it's in no particular place. So there's no coordinates. Another thought I had is what a great being said, which is, you know, die before you die. If you have already evolved such that your identification with the finite self, or sometimes referred to as the ego, if you have already dissolved your ego, mm -hmm. i.e. you've died, you're physically very much alive and you're physically, you know, functioning perfectly fine, but you have died in your smallness, then when you actually die physically, it's all cool. No, no worries. Right. Right? Everything is, is smooth. Now, I know we're running out of time, so let's touch on near-death experiences just a little bit. In general, I would say to people that there's lots and lots of amazing near-death accounts on, on social media, on YouTube. Take a look at these. They are so inspiring to hear these actual stories, okay? Because you get a real taste of somebody actually leaving the body how they transcended time and space, how they started seeing light. It's just super inspiring. So I'd like to mention a few of the common elements of near-death experiences, which have been, these are thousands and thousands of people in, that have been studied. And these four or five elements have been noted to be the common elements. Okay. The first is you have an out-of-body out of experience. So you, you actually feel like I'm out of the body and you can see the body. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. that's amazing. I always thought I was trapped in that body. And the first time you see you're not the body very clearly. So you also start transcending the space-time limitations. You start seeing right. a vaster space-time context. You also feel a tremendous sense of calmness, well-being, and love. From all directions, you feel this absolutely beautiful, divine love, just like that. And it obviously feels wonderful. Then some of them, they go far enough into the near-death experience that they have the life review process. That's a whole other topic that we will not get into in detail. But this is the part where I feel if you've already invested the time earlier on to introspect about your life, do a review, so that when the life review happens later on, you are not caught off guard. You've done a good job. You know, you've tied all the loose ends. You've released any difficult emotions. So the life review can be another very positive process. But I'm mentioning that as a common element of near-death experiences. And seeing light, seeing beings, higher beings, who are guiding us. And 
And for some, they are offered the choice whether they move on or they come back to the body. Keep in mind, these are near-death experiences, right? These are not people who finally died. So many of them had that choice and they, they chose to obviously come back. These insights, I think, are actually useful because they give us some definitive ideas about how it's going to be. And we can start adjusting and preparing ourselves for that. Yeah. So there's... There's a lot. There's so much. But you know the most beautiful thing that you... The way, like, I think we need to start dying a little to know how to live. And you just so beautifully, like, the fat way you talked about, think about it like this layers on top of each other, superimposed into... It just makes the space and time yes. gone. I think that's a very beautiful idea. Yeah. And you know, all these are not some nice, interesting philosophies. I exactly. see them as these are real insights that can dramatically change your relationship with life and death and catapult you to higher consciousness. And that's really my intention in sharing these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not so that we become some kind of scholarly experts on these types of states. This is stuff that's happening around us and will happen to us, right? It's guaranteed. Right, guaranteed. So might as well prepare ourselves. And a funny quote from Winston Churchill, he said, I'm prepared to meet my maker, whether... My maker is prepared for the great ordeal of meeting me is another <laughs> matter. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it's just amazing. I would say NDE experiences give us a direct clue. It's such spectacular realms of light, bliss, and joy await us. And death, death is just a slight transition period from, from this version of reality to something that is much truer, much more real. Right. So it's when you look at that aspect of it, it's like, oh, you know, there's there's really nothing to be concerned about here. It's it's all, it's happened millions, actually billions of times, right? It's a well-refined process of, of being dying. So... We can we can relax in that knowing. Well, that, that's I think that's a you know, you know a very beautiful and reassuring thought to in this podcast episode with. So thank you, Sunesh, for just taking out so much time to speak to us. This is really really wonderful. It is real joy, and as you can see, this is a topic that fascinates me. So I'm delighted to have it, had a chance to share about it. So thank you, Nandita. Some great questions. Right. I think I love you talking about this thing. So that's why I picked on you. I said, let's just. Yeah. Good. I'm, I'm so happy we got a chance to sit down and talk about this.